Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our first official EKN Face to Face, our new Facebook Live program. We uh, we've been we've been testing this thing out. We've been we actually we're, we started on a different platform, and now we're doing a different platform. That's why we had to, to do a test here this morning. But so we're officially at this. David Cole, uh, it's this is your 16th year with eCardiNews.com. It seems like you have to learn something new all the time. <laughs> It's it's my development. It's like an internship for an IT degree. Yeah. And I'm slowly making my way through. We've done a lot of audio. Now we're making into video. So who knows when I'm going to start doing production of live race feeds. So, you know, we'll eventually get there. I'm sure when the, the next um, virus that comes around that shuts <laughs> us down, we'll, we, I'll be able to have time to do that. So. We'll be in like the virtual world. We'll like be in your yeah. home and the you know, it'll be like holograms and stuff like that. Right? Pretty much. Yeah. Uh, so... Uh, I'd said before that uh, when we did the test that I had to go pick do my grocery pickup, my express grocery pickup where you order online. Uh, I, I missed a day with my allergy pills, so I may have to pull this out a little bit. You should be wearing gloves when you're doing that. I would, wore gloves when we went to the store. <laughs> Trust me, I did. I did. It was good. Um, Wash your hands after this broadcast. For sure. Yes, <laughs> most, most definitely. All right, so folks, let me just jump over to live comments. If you're tuning in, we'd love to hear from you. Where are you? Uh, Al Edwards from Atlanta. I love it. He's coming in. Dave's figuring this out. There's Al there from Atlanta. Jeffrey Masters as well. Thanks for all you do for the sport. I appreciate that comment. That's awesome. Again, waiting for some people to kind of come on here. The cool thing is, so David, we're streaming live here on Facebook, and we're also streaming live on YouTube, correct? Both uh, both entities. Uh, we were able to figure that out before, <laughs> after our test to, to now. So we were able to click a couple buttons and uh, and figure it out. So this is our first time streaming on YouTube live. So this is something new, uh, something, another area of our, of our social media that we want to grow is, is our YouTube page. Yeah. We kind of neglected it other than big events like super Nats and some other things. We were really into it before Facebook got really video oriented. Uh, so we did a lot of things on YouTube, yeah. but uh, uh, so we're, we're trying to grow that and we'll see, uh, we'll see how this uh, YouTube thing live goes and uh, see what kind of viewership. And again, we'll grow things from there. <clears throat> Well, it's brand new. It's something a little different. And again, for those of you who don't know about this, you'll see the graphic come up in a bit. We call it face to face. Uh, we started doing some IG live, Instagram live stories. And I would do uh, like 20, 25 minute interviews, but you can't save them anywhere. And we had like, I did a fantastic interview with James Hinchcliffe. And we did some with a bunch of people in the industry and racers like Scotty, uh, like Skitchy Barnes, but they were lived for like 24 hours on our IG live store and then they were gone. So the cool thing here is we can potentially bring people in now. And we'll be able to archive these, Dave. That's I like that. We can archive the interviews that we do. It'll be on the internet forever, unlike Instagram or Snapchat. It'll be on the it'll be on the internet forever, and and that's something we want because not everybody has the opportunities to watch something live. Like I have a radio show I listen to every morning. They did a live at night thing uh, on Friday nights at seven. Well. I'm kind of with my family. I don't like want to put earbuds in while I'm trying yeah, yeah. to watch movies with them. Yeah, so I can go back and I can watch it. Thank you, thankfully, because everything is put it on. It's stuck on the internet. So, uh, and that's kind of this thing too. You can come back and listen. We're getting comments from just our morning show of people watching it, rewatching it, and uh, and stuff like that. So it, it's always good to have that content. Let me put this out there right now. We we are setting up with a couple of shows right now, David. We've already talked to the folks at Margay. Uh, we're going to talk to Keith Freeber, and I think that either Greg Dingus, I think Greg Dingus is going to come on as well. We'll see who, who's going to come on from Margay. We'll talk about the development of their uh, Ignite program, some of the great stuff that's going on. Actually, we have a couple, I think, of their track owners that are going to join us, as, like the track managers that are going to join us as well. Um, big, Obviously, Dave, one of the big concerns is when are we going racing again? So the guys from USAC Karting, um, Mike Burrell and Jason Burgess are going to come on to talk about the battle at the Brickyard because they've opened registration for it. So we are going racing at the Brickyard. Cole and I are going to go head to head again in the shadow of the Pagoda. So we'll have them on, I think, next Tuesday. I know. Hashtag beat David Cole. No, no, no. no. Beat Rob Howden. Hashtag you've never beat Rob Howden before. Maybe I need to take a trip to Texas so I can get myself better. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Rudolph could definitely help you. All right, so let's do that right now. Good segue, David. <clears throat> Our first guest on uh, this inaugural edition of Face to Face, a guy I've known for about 23 years now. I think I did an article on him for National Cart News back in 97. I think it was about 97 or 98. Uh, Alan Rudolph from the Alan Rudolph Racing Academy, of course, at Speed Sports Racing Park in Houston, Texas. 
Uh, he's going to come and join us, and we're going to talk kind of a, a grassrootsy kind of idea about how to get qu quicker because, again, Alan is the leading coach and instructor and educator in our sport. So let's bring him in, Dave. Let's uh, see if you figured this out yet. Hey, Alan Rudolph. I love it. From uh, Live from hey, Houston. Guys. Dude, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate you having me here. Rob, as always, thanks for having me, David, too. Good job putting all this together. So here <laughs> – I'd say this, we're dying, right? We all want to get back to the racetrack. I want to get back under the mic somewhere. Drivers want to get back to the, the, uh, the in their carts. Dude, you have two racetracks. You have a rental racetrack and a, and a cart track. That you just, you've only built a couple of years ago. You must be dying Dude, not, to have, not to have carts on that track. It is killing me. I tell you, um, the silence, you can't make any money at a, at a track when there's not any noise, right? Yeah, yeah and, true uh, So, you know, we were at we were at New Orleans for the Pro Tour race when all this went sideways and everybody had to go home. And now we were like, oh, my gosh, what are we going to do? We <laughs> got back home and opened up for one day. And then uh, they, the county just shut everything down at that point. So we were, we were dead in the water. Um, but the irony in it, for me anyway, was that um, the exact same time we shut down, I had a shipment of stuff from – PSL to update my rental fleet. So Ugh. I would not have had, no, it's been perfect because I've spent oh. the last four weeks completely redoing my rental fleet. I, we, we laid everybody off, shut the business down. It was horrible. And, um, and then, but I kept one guy on. So he and I have been working all every week, all week long, rebuilding the rental car. So when we open up, it'll be like, I got a brand new fleet of rental cars. So <laughs> That's awesome. really nice. I don't know when I would have been able to do it otherwise. I mean, it's taken he and I just four weeks to make it happen. And uh, if we'd have still been open, it would have, I mean, who knows how many months it would have taken us to cycle through this. So, wow, okay. So, that from, uh, you know, from the racetrack side of things, that's actually a really been a really good thing. But being closed is, it sucks and uh, it's bad for everybody. You know, it trickles down. It does. Know, yeah. Um, all the way across the board. Well, Mike Smith from Cal Speed Karting came on and did a quick little uh, uh, little comment that he can relate, obviously, because they, of course, uh, at Cal Speed Karting have been shut down as well. All the rental cars are still sitting there, so they're they're all ready to go as well. Uh, let's talk about that briefly before we, you know, we'll get into the your coaching side. We'll talk more about that. Right. You know, obviously, some of the news that just hit. Uh, at least, you know, if you're a bowling alley in Georgia, you'd be all right because apparently, uh, the 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 governor of of Georgia. Is opening up. Uh, what is it? What is he? Uh, gyms. This is on Friday. Gyms, salons, bowling alleys, and other indoor facilities. So potential yeah. things are starting to kind of open up again. I know everybody's kind of worried about: is it too early? Whatever it may be, practice social distancing, wear a mask, whatever it is. Uh, so Georgia's starting to do stuff. I'm hearing some golf courses are going to be opening up as well. What are you here? I'm sure you have your pulse, your finger on yeah. the pulse. What's going on in Texas? What is there any hope right now in the next? Couple of here, weeks. Yeah, no, here in Texas, to be honest, it's uh, one of the better states all around, uh, yeah. in particular in Montgomery County, where we're at. It's been flatlined and going down. Um, I suspect within the next two weeks, they'll be on the 27th. Uh, the state governor is going to make another address and start figuring out who's going to be able to open first. I don't know if we'll be in that first round, but you know, look, I, I look at us. I mean, yeah, while we're an entertainment facility and I could see big places. Um, that have a thousand people roll through there a day, happen to stay closed, but we never have more than 20 or 30 people at a time. At a know? time, yeah. And yeah. we go outside. So I think there's measures that we can take easily to be open and keep people separated from each other and um, cleaning the helmets all the time and stuff. And yep. in fact, um, there's this new helmet sanitizing thing coming out. Um, it'll, it's going to be pretty neat. And I'm going to just go ahead and get one of those straight away. So <laughs> yeah, that'll, yeah. that'll look good. Um, so I think we're with inside of two weeks opening. That's um, exciting. That's the, super exciting, man. That's great. The track has been busy on the on the on the member side, though. So the one way around all of this is that we're a private private company, and we have members, and members can come play. Just okay. Stay away from each other, and so yep. um, there's been a lot of uh, uh, members come to the track. I mean, every day we're open Wednesday through Sunday. I call them our Corona hours. It's <laughs> noon to six. <laughs> uh, for members only and so there's been carters and motorcycles and i had some drifting guys out on sunday okay um, i mean we're outside away from each other it's not like you're i mean listen we were supposed to have a race the week after that nola nola race got canceled yeah and everyone wanted to do it and i was like yeah let's do it and when we, we said we were going to go ahead and do it then all of a sudden there was a few squeaky wheels that were like i can't believe you're going to be that irresponsible and and i'm like 
So as the week went on, by Saturday, we just felt like we did have to cancel it, and I did. But to those people, I would say, have you been to the grocery store? Yeah. You know, yeah. like, I yeah. mean, the grocery store or Walmart, I mean, you're elbow to elbow to people all the time. Here we are at an outdoor go-kart track. We can totally stay away from each other. Yeah, that's it. Um, and that's what that's what these guys have been doing. So, it's you know, we've had members out there. Unfortunately, members, they're already members, so they're not spending money buying stuff. And, you know, so th there's still no revenue pretty much. Uh, but we have people there, and it's, you know, uh, it doesn't feel totally dead. Well, you've got the pro shop at least, so hopefully they're being smart yeah. and buying some tires or buying some fuel oil or something from you. That's right? exactly right, yeah. And let's let's talk about the evolution of the pro shop a little bit. It's it's interesting because I know that when you first had the track open, you're you've got the school, right? So you're you have obviously the first part of the school, we'll go to that later, is, is getting guys coming out of the rental pro program into one day experiences, whatever it may be, drive a real race car, and then a one day school, then a two day school, the whole deal to get them to get them racing. There was never really ever plan. To start a racing team was there but no. you kind of yeah. have <laughs> yeah, no, that, was, that was never part of the business plan and, and uh, in fact my partner when we talked about doing it he's like it, it, you, you don't want to lose money at this he knows other teams that just lose money i'm like i'm not going to do it and it's just going to lose money i mean it has to make you know has to make sense and our overhead is pretty much fixed you know and so um it became a reality pretty quick that if we didn't come up with a race team that all these kids were going to go someplace else yeah um, there's a couple other teams here locally and um so it just became apparent that we had to do that and then this year was going to be our first year at, at national level racing so yeah we were scheduled to do the all the uspks stuff and the first pro tour race at nola and so we're looking forward to that but obviously a couple of those have been canceled now and are moved around so i don't know what's going to happen there but you know, if you think about it, it is kind of a natural extension of, of the of the school a little bit, though, is it not? You know, it's yeah. yeah there's people that are going to come in from different states to come in and do one on ones with you guys, you and Jesse and whoever, to be able to get themselves better. But some of the local drivers who are coming through the school, they, they want to stay with you. You're their coach, so they would just, you know, what? Let's just keep doing this thing and let's keep coaching them up while we while we hit up the ranks. Yeah, no, that's a big part of it. It's just a natural segue, right? I mean, yeah. Um, all the all the parents want it you know we we do private lessons with the team um do team tests and stuff like that and so um it's just it's just been part of the puzzle right now right yeah so overall again the, the great thing about speed sports racing park and what you do is you have the rental facility a separate rental facility and a separate racetrack yep. separated by like just a little walkway in between which i love because they're they're sitting there getting ready to jump on the rental carts and over their shoulder are these competition carts just calling your name on the other side, which I think is awesome. Uh, cool. And of course, that's where the school comes into play. You've also got, you run a track series there as well, too. You guys have a, a track racing series. Uh, talk about the track racing series, class structure you guys run. And again, the, the connection to drivers saying, hey, you rent, run rentally, you run the rental carts over here. You can come right over here and go racing if you want every Saturday, whatever yeah. it may be. I think, um, I don't know the exact number, but I would say we've had at least 20, maybe 30 customers directly you know from the rental track what's next do a class oh my gosh i'm hooked let's get in let's buy a card get going um, and these are so these are new customers that have you know never even seen carding before um bringing them into the sport and then you know my the best success story i guess for that one is you know jack scanlon yeah uh, jack was you know a rental car kid that was like, oh, what's this? And came and did a three-day clinic with us. And, and Jesse, well, Jesse was an instructor and um, was just bit after that, you know. And so um, there's several several of those types of stories where they go from the rentals and look over the fence and want to do that, you know. Uh, yep. That's really what it's all about. So you have the club. <clears throat> now you have, obviously, the Texas Sprint Racing Series runs in the program as well. You have other, other big series. You have a greater Houston series. Well, let's not, this is where I want to kind of go with this particular interview because I think it'll be interesting. So where – you get new people coming into the sport, obviously, right? And you, because you are a coach, so when they come over from the rental car program, they, they may buy a cart, they may buy it from Speed Sports Racing Park, they may buy it from one of the other shops or work with another shop, whatever it may be that, that comes to the series. So you're a rookie driver and you've just got, you came out of rentals and you get in the cart and you, you know, you're getting a feel for it. You're, you're running a couple of the, the club races and you're a second off. <laughs> Where do you, what do you, I, I, it's not the cart. What do you focus on? What, where for, for a rookie driver, where is the best way for them to initially find speed? What, it, what is it? If they're brand new and they're only a second off, that's pretty good. That's a lot. Okay, let's say they're two <laughs> seconds off. <laughs> now, you know what? It always, uh, there's a couple things. One, I 
always tell everybody that carts today and for the past 10 years, 15 years are so good right out of the box. You know, the manufacturers go through a, a great level of testing and all that and hire professional drivers to, to get these carts right, right out of the box. And so if you put your cart together with the seat in the right position, the front end alignment where it's supposed to be, leave it alone. Don't worry about it. Right. <laughs> yeah. So from then, uh, from then on, it's really just learning, go back to the basics, like understand that there are five different types of corners. And if you know how to drive each one of them the right way, so first we need to wind technique. Um, I can look Good. at any track map and pretty much draw the exact right drive and line around it because I know in this type of corner, I need to drive it like this, depending on where I want to be at the exit. So if you can understand that, um, vision is number one. I always just coach people on vision, looking ahead, finding reference points. You know, you come up to every corner, you should have a point where you know you're going to break, where you're going to turn, where you're going to yeah. come off the brakes, where you're going to accelerate. This all has to do with your vision and uh, looking way ahead and finding these reference points on the track. All tracks have them. I mean, it might be seams in the pavement, patches, whatever. Um, and so it's really just building that foundation and, and um, you know, don't think that you're going to go out and win your first race. Um, build up to it. Just constantly work at it. Um, everybody works at it. I mean, all race, professional race car drivers today, or what are they doing now? They're all racing, sim racing. They're That's training, it. right? Practicing, training, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. You never stop learning. What do you find to be <clears> – <throat> no, I like that. First of all, I like I like the vision because I think I, – I know I did it when I was younger. I've watched guys that do it uh, that, that they're focused on right, what's right in front of them. And you always you'll see a guy coming through a corner, and you can, you can watch it from the you can watch it from the sidelines. He'll be and he's looking right at the apex, so he's still got the wheel turned up, going try, trying to get to the apex right. when he should already be unwinding the wheel and going out, out to the exit. Right, you lose so much speed. Um, drivers charging the corner too much is that is that's that's what I usually see a lot of the club races I go to. Guys just trying to carry way too much speed into the corner. Is that one of the, the major issues? Trying to lengthen the straightaway at the end as opposed to lengthening the straightaway at the start. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I mean, my motto has always been slow in, fast out. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, you need to get back to the gas as soon as you can. Well, if you're driving into the turn so fast that you're going past the apex before you get back on the gas, well, then you're too late. Um, so <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. it's those basic things. You know, I always um, one of the hardest things to teach is, is how to brake properly. You know, yeah. especially for the little kids. I've, done, I've coached now since having my own track, I've coached a lot of little kids, like six, seven, eight year olds, you know, that I didn't do before when I was at Pondra. Uh, but now having the track, there's a bunch of little kids. And so dads always want me to, the transition from kid cart to cadet is crazy. It is. Because they just don't break. They, you know, they ride kid carts and they never get on the brake and then they get in a 50 or 60 mile hour cadet. Like, yeah, fly right off the edge. Well, break, what's the break? You know, so the very first thing is, doing braking exercises with them. And then, you know, that's not only for the kids. Those, I mean, even adults or whatever, the struggle with where do I break? More importantly, where do I come off the brake? That's, where yeah. do I accelerate? Um, so to be fast, you got to learn how to use the brakes properly. Obviously, uh, if they <laughs> if they want to do that, they come down and visit you for a school down in Houston. If they're at home by themselves at their local track, what can a driver do by themselves to improve that the initial brake hit and then rolling off the brake. Is there, is there, a, is there a, something they can do or? Well, so what I like to say, there's two, two things. Yeah, there's two things to that. One is by the eight, by the time you get to the apex of the corner, as long as you're apexing at the right spot, as yeah. long as you're at, you need to be back on the gas. Okay. Well, if you're, if you're going into the turn too fast that you're just driving past the apex before you get back on the gas, then it's too late. Right. Uh. And there's the, the slowest point in the corner is just before the apex of the turn. So I want to try to carry as much speed as I can to that slowest point in the corner and then accelerate. That's it. Okay. Right. So however much braking that takes to, and you're going to carry the brake into that, to the slowest point in the corner, and then it's time to go. There you go. I like that. Great, great insight. Uh, now let's let's look then at the. I, I want to give this kind of comparison for for people that maybe don't don't understand this. So let's turn the corner. When you're dealing with a driver who's at the very top level, let's say it's a top level junior driver, uh, you know, a guy like Jace Park, who you, I know you've coached. What's the focus more? When, like just just because I know there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of people that are going to watch this, so they're going to be rookies, first year, second year drivers trying to find more speed. What's the difference when you're when you're working with a driver who already has a lot of that, what's, what do you focus on there? What's the primary target? 
of instruction. Well, then with everyone, um, and more so with, with who you're talking about, the client you're talking about, but you got to find their weak points, right? And so you got to find out the areas where they're struggling a little bit. Sometimes it might be race crafts. Others, it might be might be the breaking thing. Others, yeah. um, so you got I got to find out where their weaknesses is first, and then we dive way more into the um, data. Do a lot of data, and I'll go drive with them, and we do race scenarios. Yeah. And I'll my data to theirs, overlap stuff. Uh, Jace was a Jace was a different um, different cat in that he came right when he was making the transition from cadet into junior. To junior, yeah. So that was a big jump for him at the time. He hadn't been in a full size cart, and so um, you know he had a couple of days of steep learning. Did a great job. I mean, he was fast. Um, so he he was he was learning a lot all at one time, making that transition from cadet to junior. So do you like, see that? Do you, do you see coaching like what you guys do there as being, is, is that like one of the really good sweet spots? You know, you can teach somebody the basics and again, you, if you, you invest in, if you have, I would say you invest in yourself, right? So you invest, invest in your, your own skills. Don't, don't buy another axle. Don't keep burning money on tires, invest in your skills, have a coach to help you like yourself. Yep. That's one thing you guys do. Is that, do you feel that that, that jump from cadet, because again, it's such a steep learning curve. You guys can do it in a three-day weekend, right? As yeah. opposed to four it, months of racing. Yeah, no, it certainly helps. It absolutely helps in that way. Um, but I, I would also say that it depends on depends on the, the the driver, the kid, the adult, whatever. Everyone learns at a different That's pace, yep. you know. And so, us as coaches have to learn how to navigate the customer. You know, like like I said, finding out where their weak spots are, what they want to learn. You know, the dad will come to me. Um, and I encourage parents to come, uh, dad, mom, or whoever, if it's dad working with them, uh, and be involved in the class. Um, parents will come to me and they'll, they'll say, oh, I just want to stay back. They're going to go up in the office and work while I'm doing And I'm like, no, I want you to listen so that they take in and learn the information as well. Because in many cases, the, the dad was a <laughs> 20 story that I was telling, it was a, it was a, a daughter and her dad. And um, I was telling them how they should, should be doing driving it this way or whatever and she kind of looked at and she's like see i told you you were telling me wrong and so <laughs> but a lot of times the parents don't really know you know they're, they're going off of what they think might be right or information that they've heard from somebody else from other sides yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Both sides. i mean in many cases if, if you ask 10 different people in the paddock you're probably going to get 10 different answers um the big the common one in karting trail braking the term trail braking means trailing off the brake pedal right if you ask any carter out there what trail braking is, they're going to say dragging the brake. You're dragging so the brake. Stay on the gas and drag the brake. No, that's dragging the brake. <laughs> that's not trail braking, right? Yeah. And so even the best coaches, I've people that I've known for a long time, will tell a kid to trail the brake through the corner, and I always tell them or ask them, what does he mean by trail the brake? And nine times out of ten, they're going to say stay full gas and drag the brake pedal or whatever. Um, and to that's, me, that's not trail driving, braking. That's not trail braking. That's not trail so um, you got to make sure that, you know, so I like to educate dad and the kid as well. Yeah. And so when they leave, then dad can be an educated coach and can help learn from there. I want to ask you a question about different learning styles, because at one point, uh, 20 something years ago, uh, I was a ski instructor. And one of the things that my lead instructor taught me when I first started was the fact that people learn in different ways. And you have to, one of the first things you have to do is kind of pick up, on how they learn. Some people learn by by being told how to do it and then yep. doing it. Some people want to see it done so they can emulate it and get the feel for it. Is, is that something you, you find in karting? I'd, I'd have to believe that you have to figure out what the driver, the, 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 the whatever the comfort level is and what works for them in terms of how to actually learn something right. new. hundred percent. I mean, yeah. that's exactly right. As a, as a coach, um, all the best coaches around the country learn how to adapt to the student, learn how to speak to them in a way that they understand it. I mean, I have to talk to an engineer completely different than I would talk to, you know, a younger kid for sure. Yeah. Um, engineers are very, you know, um, and so as a, as a coach, being at Bondurant all those years and stuff, you just talk to so many people, you learn how to, you learn how to manage that. And so I always like to say that our courses are completely individualized yeah. and catered, catered to the individual and what their needs are. And, and I bring that up because, you know, you got, that's what you do for a living. You're a professional coach, you're a professional teacher and instructor. And I see it so many times when I'm standing on the fence or whatever, when I see a parent who never raced themselves, 
try to that. try to tell a kid how to drive the cart. And I'm, I'm like, listen, I know I've been in this for 25 years. I know you've never raced a thing. Right. And number one, so you're telling your kid how what he should be doing in a corner, probably because yeah. you heard somebody else say it. You're telling your kid, but what if your kid doesn't doesn't learn by you telling him something? Yeah. It's just, it's just I, I see that disconnect that I hate. And I wish they, I would like to say, go to Alan and let him do it because that's, it's yeah. just, it's, it's just counter counterproductive and what they need to do for that child. Right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I had a conversation with, with someone just last year that the gentleman was getting really upset with his son because he wouldn't pass. And uh, finally, after he was getting really upset, I finally had to ask him, I said, I said, have you ever passed any, have you ever raced? <laughs> and he goes, no. I go, passing's not easy. The kid's like eight years old. I go, it's not as easy. And he looked at me like he didn't believe that it wasn't something easy to do. And, <laughs> nah, no, 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 it's not. So, um, yeah, definitely. Uh, and another funny story was a dad who was getting frustrated. And uh, he's, this kid comes in. He's like, let me show you how to do it. Jumps in the cart, goes out there, flogs the thing around. Would have bet a million dollars that he was way faster than his kid. He was like five seconds a lap slower than his kid. Jumps out of the cart and goes, "That's how you do it." And uh, he has no idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, and that's. Does it feel weird sometimes that uh, you're not just teaching the kid, but you have to teach the parent as well? Maybe even yeah, more so. Absolutely. Because you said, because you said, Alan, the good, it's a good reason why they're there with you when you're teaching them. Because when you leave, the parents the one. Down. And the parent's the one that's going to keep putting the message into their head. They have to have your message, right? That's right. That's 100% right. So I right, always hold, hold on. Hold, hold on, Alan. Yeah. Matt, David, bring this up. Matt Blame. <laughs> no, Matt's. I love you describing me right now, the dad doing all the wrong things. So, <laughs> sorry. Matt, 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 there is hope for you. I'm yeah. glad you tuned in. Alan's going to be your guru right now. <laughs> I love it. That's yeah. perfect. And, yeah, no, I encourage anytime the parents. Um, you know the parents always come if it's a if it's a younger yeah you know, they up through teens or whatever the parents are always there and and I always make them sit through the ground schools uh, track talks uh, debriefs in between you know they can you know if they want to go off and do some work every once in a while that's fine or whatever but I encourage the parents to be involved in in the in the course as well um, just so that they're hearing the information and seeing it and. Um, whether it's just talking about talking track talks or whatever, or that ground school. But when we get into data, if, if the students at that level where we get into data, um, in many cases, parents have never even looked at that stuff before or yeah. see some graphs on, you know, that's right. See some graphs on the computer, but don't really know how to work with it. And so it's a good learning tool for, for the parents as well. Hey, uh, David, bring up Mike Smith's last question. I like that last message here. I, I, I like that a lot. He says that uh, the coach can say exactly the same thing as the parent, but they'll listen to the coach. That's for sure, right? <laughs> now, okay, so now bring up Chuck Gaffera's question. He just, Chuck came in and said, I like Chuck's here as well, David. Kid cart parents. <laughs> oh, well, now, yeah. but hold on. So here's my transition then. I want to know how this worked for you because you're an instructor, you're a coach, you have a kid that races, so you're a parent. Yeah. How did the coaching, instructing, parent dichotomy go with your son Aiden? Have the same. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter. It's all the parents are right. Um, uh, have the same problem. Um, <laughs> uh, but I don't anymore. But I can tell you, at first it was like, well, you know, in one ear, right out the other, yeah. you know. Because uh, you're just a parent. Yeah, just a parent. Your dad. So we, all, we all have the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> that's I find that to be hilarious because here you are as this 25 year racing instructor. You got to believe that your son is going to respect what you're telling him, but they're kids. <laughs> Dad doesn't kids, know right? crap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. If you have any more questions for Al Rudolph, pop them up here right now, folks on Facebook or if you're on YouTube, great one with Mike Smith. Uh, you talked about having your own team, uh, Alan at speed sports racing park. How do you balance that relationship with it, with existing teams that support your series and everything you're doing? At, uh, at speed sports well that's easy i mean the you know like uh, at our club level race we we have um anywhere between 10 and 12 team members that are in our shop on race team day and i you know have a, a race director that comes in for our club races so i don't play race director i'm i'm the race team guy the the shop running the shop or running the race team and yep. and i'm a race dad too so you know, Aiden's out there racing, and and so I, our races, I run it just you know I let the the race crew, the um, 
uh, race director and his staff run the races and I kind of stay away from it so that I don't have any bias one way or the other. And uh, it's been no issues whatsoever. You know, our club level races we have uh, once a month, basically. And uh, we did, uh, you mentioned the Greater Houston series. We kind of, you know, Katy, the, the car track here in Katy, Texas, has been around for 30 years or whatever. Yeah. And when we opened, I didn't want to, like, come across to squash in them. And, and uh, oh, Big Speed Sports is opening up and Katy's going to go away. No, man, they got a good group of people out there. And so we want to to grow uh, karting in Texas, and there's no reason we can't work together, or grow karting in Houston. And so we just created this Greater Houston series where some race, races are at our track, other races are at their track, and so the customers go to both tracks, and it's yeah. worked out really well, no issues. One of the things I would expect, too, uh, when it comes to the team itself, Speed Sports, is you have, you know, you, you don't have a 30 a thirty driver team, right? You've got yeah. a, certain amount of, a certain amount of room yeah. in the back, in the back, you have yeah. other, and you'll have other teams that come in. Right? You, you you understand from the, all the time you've been in the sport, it can't just be you. You need to have the crosslinks and the other teams come in, right, to be able to run four, five, six to ten guys themselves to support the whole program as you grow it. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, um, but at a club level, though, most people. It, I mean, there's only a couple of. There's only really there's a team here in Houston anyway. It's us. Um, Crosslink is up in Dallas. They come down That's for true. a club race here yep. and there, but you know we're the only real team per se. Um, everyone else at a club level, it's dad, mom out of the back of their truck or camper or whatever, you know, come in for the day, for the weekend. And so it's a lot of call it privateers, you know, it's, okay. it's, it's that club level scenario. Yeah, that's true. Uh, question from Frankie Schaff here as well. He says, uh, he says, what is the experience level required for a three day course? Dave, can you pop that up? So for your three day course at the school, what is the experience level required for that? Uh, no real requirements. I would say that I wouldn't, it would be too much for one person. I mean, for somebody brand new into the sport to come and do three days. If you if you don't have any experience whatsoever, I would say get some seat time, a little bit of seat time first, because it's a lot of driving too. And so if you're not physically up to the task of driving for two days, so the, the clinic is really cool because it's uh, the first day is on track. The second day is in the shop learning how to maintain and work on your cart all right um, if you, you know and and then the third day you're back on track and that shop day is really cool because some guys like to tinker on their stuff and work on it and they want to know so we take the cart all apart take the engine apart carburetor apart kind of go through it show them how to put oh, it back man. together work on it um other guys they've been working on their stuff for you know five six years they, they already know how to do all that so then we focus more on chassis setup and stuff we'll teach them how to do alignments properly and um, and what this change does if we change the ride height or camber caster or whatever. So I kind of go over all that. So that shop day, again, is also kind of catered to what that individual is looking for. And then third day back on track. So um, it's a lot of driving, too. So that's why I say uh, a little bit of experience and uh, would be would be best to come. Mike Smith, Mike Smith is trying to ask you lots of questions to glean some information from you, I think. He's... <laughs> <laughs> from that one up, Dave. He says track walks. When it comes to track walks, what are you trying to relay to your students? How does that differ from club to national? Of course, Mike, uh, one of the instructors, kind of takes care of his crew at, at Cal Speed. But a good question to, to to allow people to understand what a track a track walk is worth. And I know a lot of people. I find it weird. A lot of people don't do track walks when they come, even if they come to their own track, they can go out and do a track walk. Because anytime we go anywhere on the Indy Car Circuit, whatever it is. We have a track walk on Thursday. Every IndyCar yeah. driver's out there. Everybody's out there to see if the track's changed at all, or even right. just to remind themselves of the track by walking around. You can pick up so much going around the track, walking it, than you are driving around, correct? 100%. Yeah. Uh, because you get up, you go out, and no one is going to drive around at, you know, half speed for five, six laps and look for little stuff or whatever. Yeah. No, when you strap your helmet on and you go, you go. And so it doesn't give you the time to really look for those little things on the track. So you walk the track and you look for, like I said earlier, the patches, yes. yeah. um, curb that might have some missing paint that shows you your apex or whatever. And when I'm doing a track walk, I'm walking on the line or at least as close to the right line as I think, because if you don't, then you're not gonna see those little things. You know, if you're walking around the outside edge of the track, well, then that doesn't tell you anything, you know? Um, you need to be walking on the line that you think is the right driving line so that you can find these little marks all over the track. 
You know, it was interesting when we were at Amarillo, when I was out there with you guys at Amarillo for the Texas Pro Car Challenge race last year, um, I actually went out and at the, on Saturday night, like we were Saturday, Sunday race, Saturday night, I went out with Jake French to walk the track again. He was walking the track again. I'm like, do you mind if I come with you? He goes, I guess, so what are you doing? He goes, I just want to see if I can't pick up a 10th or two here and there. Right. Because he goes, I just, I just don't, I didn't feel right, perfect in this corner here, and I want to th- see if I can change it a little bit. That's a great example. Coming from Jake Fred, my guy. Yeah. Like, you think he really needs to do another track walk, but he's yeah. looking for one little tent, right? One little bit. One little bit. What else we got, David? You brought something else up there? Oh, oh. <laughs> this is, comes from David Cole. What trophies are behind you, yours or Aiden's? Yeah. <laughs> so, this uh, where I'm at is upstairs in the man cave, right? Well, it's, yeah. what it's turned into is the Aiden man cave because I never really come up here. So, yeah, those are mostly all his trophies and stuff, but the, I did. I propped up the uh, Scoos the Hall of Famer trophy there in the back. Yeah, I like that one. Good for you. That's, not, yeah, that's, yeah, all. That was, that's, that's true because listen, back when, when Al was actually racing, they didn't have trophies made of plastic. They were all back in steel back those days, right, Al? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what we, got? we got one more question from Mike. Let's Because let's, this is good, actually. Throwing it out there. Uh, it's Dave Cole. They're all made of wood. Yours, yours are all yeah, made my, of wood. They were. My garage is full of that shit. Let me tell you. Yeah. That, like question for you. I don't like I, I don't have a ton of trophies like you did. I don't you know I raced for a certain but I don't I didn't keep all my trophies. I donated mine back to my club. I have a couple of race wins, a rookie of the year, that kind of thing. Do you yeah. did you keep most of your trophies or all the cool big ones, yes. Yeah. Uh, at least I think they're cool. Jessica doesn't think they're so cool anymore, but like <laughs> I'm surprised they made the move a couple of times. Um so I have all my stuff set up in the garage downstairs and um that's probably where it'll stay until the next move. You know what we'll do? Let's do the fast five. We've fast. done this before. Let's do the fast five. Five rock trophies. Hey, what was your Alan Rudolph? What was your first go-kart? Oh, geez. The first <laughs> racing go-kart? Your first racing go-kart. What was it? I think it was a Margay. Wow, all right. Yeah. I'm pretty so sure you- it was. It was somebody, somebody my dad did that. We had an automotive shop, and my dad did a trade for working on this guy's car, and he gave us this racing go-kart. And I'm not mistaken, it was a Margay. I love that. That's fantastic. Now, what year was that? Oh, Lord, Chow. You really want to know? That's, <laughs> that's why I asked, get, that's I asked the question. That's my age, yeah, like 1979. So, Rob. Yes. Let's just put it on the record because I'm, 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 I'm ready to admit this. Hold on. This is happening. You ready? Go. In three months, July 4th. I will be 50 years old. 50 years old. Breaking news, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Look at the pipes. Wow. <laughs> I know that somebody asked me, they said, how do you, I saw this before on one of the things, I think it was when my, we talked about coming on, somebody was asking how you can stay looking like you're 29 years old for the your entire life. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to admit it. I'm over it now. I'm just trying to make 50 look good. All That's right. All. You got, yeah, the pipes look pretty good. You've been working out. That's awesome. Every day. Every day? Well, five days a week. Another question, and it's not part of the Fast Five, but how do you keep your, how does your hair stay the same when you take your helmet off? That's a great question. It never it's, changes. You gotta have the right product. Yeah. And here's the key as soon as you take your helmet off, fix it. I have, a, right. I have a feeling that you, like, you, you the inside of your helmet, you have your hair done and then you, like, back and pack it like you're doing a seat. Right. Like it's a, you have, like, a bead helmet. So it, your hair. <laughs> yeah, that would be special custom helmets. The bead That's helmet. it. Um, uh, no, you can't say your track right now. What is other than speed sports? What's your favorite racetrack? Ooh, favorite racetrack, man. That's a tough one. There's so many good ones. I know. Think about racing back in the day. I love, by the way, you're bringing back uh, some photos with Alfonso and yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's great. But the yeah. one picture of him, I think, was at Oklahoma. You know, for like a legendary track that just was a. Yeah. For sure, right? Norman, when it rubbered up, was a son of a gun. And it was always fun to drive, great racing. Dude, the infield loop. Yeah. Oh. yeah, that was just brutal. You're like, ah. Hey. For those there. of you, listen, for those of you people who uh, bitch and complain about racing where we are nowadays, and it's two sets of tires for the weekend, the Promoto Tour back in the days, that year, 1999, you got yeah. six tires for the weekend, five yeah. lap qualifying three lap heat race and a main event was just six tires. So you had to figure out which tires. If I'm not mistaken, I think you had something happen with your, uh, with your motor mount or something like that before the start of the race, you're on a Haas with Privus racing and, and you chased down Jason LaPointe 
for that race. It was the second race of the Pro Tour promoted tour. His fronts were garbage, and he was yeah. like full. Yeah. Yeah. He, was full yeah. Yeah. he was full lock, and you were eating him up, but he you just didn't have quite enough to win it. But that six tires for the weekend, and they were yeah. Y-E-Xs. Yeah. Remember how sticky those were back then? Uh, brutal. You couldn't drive after the cool after the checkered flag. You couldn't drive slow because you couldn't turn. No, you had to drive fast enough yeah. to be, be up on top of the rubber to even drive around the damn track. Oh my god! All right, uh, question question number three: What is the biggest win in your karting career? You know, there's there's the gosh, the legend stuff like the. In Quincy Park, if you think about the remember used to Miller Mile deal, right? The Miller Mile, yeah. Miller Mile, that was that was a big deal. That was pretty awesome. I love that. Um, and the the cool part about that one is remember they used to do Calcutta and uh, Keith Freeber. So I wasn't even on a Marge, and Keith Freeber bet on me to win against Seligren and Evans. So that was pretty cool. Hey, you want a couple? You won a couple king of the street races. A couple king of the street races. <laughs> obviously, for me, the last one I think was the biggest, best because it was the last one with me and Richie Bucksman. So that yeah. was cool. your first king of the streets actually was at Quincy. Yes. Yep. I think I got it right here. <laughs> You're digging out some archives. Let me see if I can find. Well, oh, there's this one. This was issue two point three. Nice. Oh, on Rudolph. the KGB. On the KGB, yeah. dude. Remember yeah. that? Yeah. I love looking. I like going back through these things. I, I, don't know. Know, like, I don't know where it is. What year was that? That was the first year. I don't have that issue in here right now. I'll find it. Uh, oh, I have them. Don't worry. Question number four. Yes. EK and Fast Five. Who was your biggest rival in karting? Ooh, man. It depends on – Rob, I've been doing it for a long time, so there was rivals throughout the – Okay, let's <laughs> – <laughs> let's so, let's like, let's go through a couple of the chapters then. <laughs> yeah, right. So there was a time where um, you know it would be like uh, Michael Valiente. He was yeah. for a while, right? He was one of the hey, somebody asked. Maybe it was you asked me a long time ago. You know, like who was who do you think was the best Carter at the time or whatever? And I, Michael was my number one pick on that. He was just solid. And he was all the time. You know. Yeah. Um, and then all you know. Right toward the end of me, you know, running Pro Shifter and stuff like that. Then, um, God, who I don't even know. There's so many fast. I mean, you think about Almondinger and all the fast guys, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, and then and then we, yeah. Speed. I mean, you, I went through both speed phases. I got <laughs> Scott. You know, yeah. that deal with Scott, and then Scott goes away, and then Alex, and Alex is just as fast or faster than Scott. That's you know, it. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's always, you know, look at the top level, you're always going to have now who is it? You know, it's Jake French and yep. uh, Musgrave. And, you know, there's always going to be those, you know, fast guys. Yeah, no uh, doubt. All right. Final question for the EK and Fast Five. Then we'll get to a couple more questions from the from our guests here, or from our, our people watching. Who has been your, in your, again, this is a couple different chapters. Who has been your biggest mentor or influence over your career? Uh, it, oh, my dad, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. He's always been around and still is and loves to go do this stuff. So he, he comes to a race whenever he can. I love it. All right. And, and now, like, of course, he was, you know, it was your dad. Now he's grandpa at the racetrack. Yeah. Right. And he hasn't changed a bit. <laughs> <laughs> is he is he more stressed now than it, for you with Aiden? Or, no, no, I don't think so. I don't feel like he was ever really stressed per se. Okay. Uh, he's just. You know, they he always did things a certain way, and he still does wants to do this thing a certain way. David, hold up on that. I, I'm gonna, David. I'm gonna bring up David Pergande's question. Can you do that for me, David Pergande? You talked about uh, about uh, the fact that you coach kids who are six, seven, eight years old, and I love the fact that karting doesn't matter how old you are. What's the oldest driver that you ever coached? Do you know? Wow, I don't. Um, oldest driver. Don't if you're yeah. gonna say me. <laughs> Yeah, you. <laughs> at Amarillo. <laughs> uh, yeah, you at Amarillo. Yeah. No, uh, gosh, the oldest driver probably. I don't know about coach, but there's a there's a guy that is uh, comes and races our kart racing. I mean, our league at the track in the rental carts. Yeah. And he's seventy eight years old. That's awesome. And he's been racing go karts all like since he was young. He's brought me some magazines with vintage kart stuff, and he's been doing this for a long time. His wife wouldn't when we first opened, he came out a couple times and then he disappeared. And then he 
came back just like a year and a half later and he's and because we had to get roll cages roll, roll bars on the mm -hmm. rental carts and he said my wife wouldn't let me drive them because they didn't have seat belts in them anymore so now i got seat belts and roll bars so he's allowed to drive them <laughs> and he kicks the shit out of all the younger kids at our lead races we do an iron man it's a one hour race one driver one hour yeah he finished fourth in the last one against like 20 year olds i love it Imagine driving a rental cart for an hour. No, I can't. They're heavy. No, right? And so <laughs> anyway, I let him uh, for his birthday, for his 78th birthday a couple of months ago, I put him in our LL206 cart. Yeah. And he just slayed it. It was great. You would uh, not you would not know the dude was 78 years old. He did a great job. Dude, that is awesome. All right, uh, David, you brought it up before. Let's go to Steve Reisner's question talking about uh, – yeah, found... Oh, there it is. <laughs> the king. I love it. Issue number five. Is that five or, or is it three? Is that issue three? Uh, let's see. Bottom Let's right hand corner. Bottom right hand corner. Volume one, issue five. Yes. Issue five. Yeah. And the reason why you see that, if I'm not mistaken, does it have the yeah, I was on the we were on the newsstand back then. Yeah. I spent so, a lot of money, a dude, lot of money to put it on the newsstand. I love that magazine. Well, and that was the shirt I was gonna wear today. I had my other I had my shifter card illustrated shirt. Too, that's so. that's cool. I love it. All right, so Steve. Yeah. We were talking about the rubber. Steve Reedner says, what about Monterey when they had to melt the rubber off the track because we laid so much down? I'm not sure which Monterey is talking about, but I, remember, yeah. I know that we've done that a couple times, uh, right. that it was that bad. It was at Santa Maria the one year. It was like, it, it was, it had to be this thick. Yeah. yeah. And I know that in one of the old issues of Ski, whoever was doing the marketing for Burrell that year had taken a picture of the track on the Monday after the yeah. Super Nats. Out at out at uh, the rock pile out at Las Vegas Karting Center, and it was literally a, an inch and a half thick, just all the way through the corners. It was, man, the that was a wild. Pile. I hadn't heard it called that before, but yeah, you've never heard it called the rock pile. No, oh, we've called that for free. You know why for sure. All right, listen, man, this has been great. We're almost a full hour into the show, Alan. Thank you so much for uh, joining me, buddy. Much. I really appreciate it. Dude. This has been great. Thanks for having me, Rob. As always, love having you guys as partners and. Uh, Hopefully this Corona shit has got the door here shortly and uh, we'll move on and everybody get back to racing. Yeah. The one thing we keep talking about folks, and this is, I, I always say when you're, when you're into this coming into the sport and you're new, you know, you invest in yourself, you buy good tools, you buy whatever it needs to be right to be fast in the first couple of years, invest in yourself, invest in good coaching and testing time. Leave your, like Talon said, the cart's perfect. The cart. Put the, put the base set, set up on it and just drive it. Right. The cart is perfect. In fact, there was a, a really good customer of ours had bought a 175 shifter about a year, year and a half ago. He's just been pounding out there, driving laps, lap after lap after lap. And the guy, he's, he's, he likes to tinker, right? Yeah. So he was always making changes thing. He just come in and talk my ear off for an hour about how he make all these changes, you know, and how he could just barely feel this, that, the other. And, and, uh, it took Jake French telling him to just put it back to the standard setup. He put it back to the standard setup. Now he has about, you know, eight months or more or a year of experience, puts it back to the standard setup as it was right out of the box. And he's like, oh, my God, why didn't I just? So there was a, there's a new customer that was looking at a shifter cart the other day. And that customer walks by and Scott is his name. Scott says, tells the guy, whatever you do. Don't touch it after they give it to you. Just leave it alone. <laughs> Everybody wants to do something with it, right? I know. You know? Clean it. Hey, lube the chain. Yep. Chain tension the chain and clean it. Nut and bolt check the heck out of it. Every time you drive it, lube the chain and nut and bolt it so nothing falls off it and have fun. That's it. That's it. Alan, bud, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. Thanks, Rob. All right, bud. Awesome. David yeah. Cole, we're not sure how we're going to end this thing off. Hey, we're going to end it off like this. Boom. Bam. Dave. Congrats. I'm back. Solid production, David. Well done. Yeah, hey, that's what I do. I was doing a lot of other things that didn't pertain to us, but I was listening in and moving things around, and yeah. That was, that was fun. The first time we had a chance to use this. Uh, Jeff giving a shout out there. Thank you so much for inspiring uh, the inspiring interview, EKN, and thank you, Alan, for doing this. Yeah, big thank you to uh, to um, to Alan Rudolph for joining us. Again, I just wanted Alan to kind of to reiterate, maybe plant the seed into a bunch of uh, for the drivers, Alan, I mean, David, that are – that are fresh into the sport and new, maybe, you know, maybe they bought a cart and they haven't been able to drive it yet. You know, they like they're losing their mind that they haven't been able to start the season yet. They want to do that. Um, listen to Alan, leave your go-kart the way it is baseline, 
invest in yourself, invest in learning how to drive, invest in coaching. Well, I'll tell anybody, plan a trip down to Speed Sports Racing Park. Not only do you get a chance to work with Alan and his crew, that track is the absolute best, man. Speed Sports Racing Park, what a fantastic facility. Uh, great racetrack, a lot of great restaurants in Houston, if that's, if that's your game. But uh, no, it's, it's an awesome deal. So David, there you go. First face-to-face -face in the books. That's it. We'll schedule – we got another one uh, coming up Thursday, I believe, right? Yeah, we're looking to try to get the guys from Margate to talk about the development of the uh, the Margate Ignite program, what they've got going. Gonna, we're going to talk to a couple of the track, or local track owners and how it's helped them quickly develop a, a, a strong baseline. Uh, new track at uh, the Audubon, Audubon track as well, so we'll bring some more people to talk about that. Uh, just before we came on, I was messaging with Jason Burgess, flagman extraordinaire uh, for the USAC karting program. We're going to talk about the battle at the Brickyard, their plans there. Kind of want to reiterate to everybody that we're going racing. You know, that, that race is until the end of July. So where are we? May, June. We're still three months away from that event. Things starting to open up here and there. We'll cross our fingers that everything's going to be great there. But uh, otherwise, David, we're done. This has been great, bud. That's it. I'm ready to go. Let's end it. Shut it down. <laughs> Book it. All right. Oh, no, no, see, I messed that one up. We're still alive! <laughs>